Imagine a massive cosmic monster that has the potential to change the orbits of all of the planets in our solar system and influence the way it will evolve in the future. A realm that is so cloaked in mystery and intrigue that it has captivated both researchers and enthusiasts of outer space alike for decades. This is the story of Planet Nine, and in this video, we will find out all of its secrets and look at the latest theories and findings about this amazing celestial beast. From theories on it being a rogue planet flung out from a distant part of the Milky Way galaxy to it being a potential primordial black hole, we will go into the depths of its history. This is your host, Yash Roma from Wyverse. Join me today as we explore the outermost fringes of our solar system in search of the mysterious invisible Planet Nine. Astronomers have been completely absorbed in the never-ending search for Planet Nine for more than a hundred years. The search for Planet Nine can be traced back to the early 1900s when a group of astronomers noticed that something seemed to be changing Uranus and Neptune's orbits in a rather unexpected manner. These astronomers had a hunch that there was another large planet beyond Neptune, so they started looking for it. This was the beginning of the search for Planet Nine. American astronomer Percival Lowell, who founded the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, conducted one of the first searches for Planet Nine in the early 1900s. Lowell was a strong advocate for the concept of a ninth planet, and he spent a significant portion of his career looking for evidence of its existence. He was certain that there had to be another planet somewhere in the cosmos, something massive enough to influence the gravitational pull of the other planets, and he referred to this planet as Planet X. Finding Planet X became his lifelong goal. The first part of Percival Lowell's search for Planet X ran from 1905 to 1909, he called the search the unchangeable plane search. Based on the changes that he had seen around Uranus, Lowell and his small team of mathematicians, led by head mathematician Elizabeth Williams, did a series of different calculations to figure out where the new planet was likely to be. Lowell then used his 24-inch Clark telescope to take pictures of these planets. When he realized that this telescope wasn't good enough for the search because it had a small field of view, he bought a new 5-inch Brasher telescope to keep working. William H. Pickering, a former colleague who later became a rival, wrote about the orbit and location of a possible trans-Neptunian planet in 1910. This made Lowell step up his search. Lowell now saw his search as a race to find a planet before Pickering and other people who thought they might find one. From 1910 until his death in 1916, he spent countless hours on the second part of his quest. Lowell redoubled his efforts in mathematics by using the latest technology such as a million dollar calculating machine that is still on display at Lowell Observatory. He also used the Sproul Observatory at Swarthmore College to borrow a 9-inch telescope which was much better than the 5-inch brass shade that he was using earlier. Lowell estimated where Planet X was by using new math and better tools. He put his findings in a book called Memoir on a Trans-Neptunian Planet, which was published by the Lowell Observatory in 1915. Lowell died the next year, so he never really had a chance to do a photographic search in the area of the sky that he had chosen. Roger Lowell Putnam, Percival's nephew, took over as the observatory's sole trustee 11 years after Lowell's death. This was the start of the last part of the observatory's search for Planet X. One of his top goals was to get back to looking for Planet X and prove that Lowell was right. Abbott Lawrence Lowell, Percival's younger brother and the president of Harvard University at the time, gave $10,000 to build a new astrograph, which is a 13-inch telescope used for taking pictures. To operate the telescope, director V.M. Slifer hired a young man from Kansas of the self-made type called Clyde Tombow. Tombow arrived in Flagstaff in 1929 and quickly took over the systematic search for Planet X, examining the area of sky indicated by Lowell in his book. 
The 13-inch telescope was ideal for the search, and Tombaugh had the patience and attention to detail necessary for the work. He found what would soon be called Pluto on February 18 of 1930. This finished the search that Percival Lowell had started 25 years earlier. But let's make one thing very clear. Even after more than 100 years of searching, Planet X has not yet been identified. So why do we think it even exists in the first place? Astronomers had thought for a long time that there might be a Planet X in the dark areas far beyond the gas giants. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. This is how Pluto was found in 1930. This speculation was the motivation behind the search for Pluto. The same astronomers took on a whole new tone in March 2014, when a pair of astronomers from the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, named Mike Brown and Konstantin Vatigan, made the announcement that they had discovered a brand new dwarf planet. The body, which they refer to as 2012 VP113, can be found in a location that is nestled beyond the Kuiper Belt, which is a gigantic ring of icy and rocky debris that is also home to Pluto. This wasn't the only object of its kind, however. Sedna, an icy rock that was found in 2003 and almost a thousand kilometers across, also had this far out orbit, and it seemed to be coming closest to the Sun at the same angle as 2012 VP113. It's possible that this was just a coincidence, but it could also indicate that a massive planet was lurking, hiding somewhere out there in the dark, and was guiding both of their movements. Brown was captivated by this. An expert on the far reaches of the solar system, his 2005 discovery of the dwarf planet Eris forced planetary scientists to reconsider Pluto's status as a full-fledged planet. After being referred to as many years as a ninth planet in the solar system, Pluto was eventually demoted to the status of a dwarf planet. After reading up on 2012 VP113 and Sedna, Brown went down the hall, hurriedly, to see Vatican, who studies how the solar system has changed over time. Although Vatican really hadn't given much thought to the possibility of unseen planets in the solar system before, he found the data on Sedna and 2012 VP113 to be quite intriguing. Vatigan and Brown took into consideration a number of different possibilities. They investigated the motions of half a dozen distant objects in the solar system in the hopes that the patterns of their orbits might reveal the gravitational fingerprint of a planet that had previously been hidden from view. Once they started going, they started to notice a strange pattern. When compared to the orbital plane of Earth and the other planets in the solar system, the orbits of all of these objects were inclined downward at roughly the same angle. In addition, their orbits, which included their perihelia, the points at which each object passed closest to the Sun, were clustered rather than near one another. Brown was really confused by these orbits, as they frequently crossed paths with one another. He reasoned that there should be no way for these intersecting courses to remain stable unless there was something else in the solar system that was massive enough to shepherd these objects along their strange tracks. Researchers used complicated computer models to figure out that there's only a 0.007% chance that these closely spaced orbits happen by chance. The search started getting very interesting very quickly. They came to the conclusion that the planet would have had to have a lengthy orbit that would be elliptical in shape. But even when it was at its closest, it was located at a whopping 200 astronomical units away. At its furthest point, it might be anywhere between 600 to 1200 AUs away from the Sun. In comparison, Neptune is located approximately 30 AUs away from the Sun, while the boundary of the Kuiper Belt is located approximately 50 AUs away from the Sun. To put that into perspective, one AU, or one astronomical unit, or the distance between the Earth and the Sun, is about 150 million kilometers, or 93 million miles. The computer simulation experiments showed that the orbits of Sedna and 2012 VP113, along with some of these other objects, in a clear and concise way. 
but the real strength of their prediction was that it explained the behavior of many other things that the scientists really didn't set out to explain in the first place. The model demonstrated that there must exist some strange category of objects that move in a direction that is perpendicular to the plane of the planet. This seemed completely absurd at first, but after further observations and many more calculations later, there were in fact numerous known objects moving in a manner that matched a lot of those previous calculations. If Planet 9 were found in the locations that astronomers believe it to be in, it would be in keeping with touch with the recent astronomical customs. Urbain Laverrier, a Frenchman, made mathematical predictions in 1846 that led to the discovery of Neptune, the most distant planet in our solar system. Johann Gottfried Galle, a German astronomer, discovered Neptune within a day of receiving Laverrier's calculations. On the other hand, the discovery of this new distant world is likely to be much more challenging than the discovery of Neptune. It would be approximately 32 billion miles away from the Earth when it was at its closest point, which is a distance at which very little sunlight can reach. If Planet 9 is out there and waiting to be discovered, it will need extremely powerful telescopes like the Keck Observatory and the Subaru Telescope in Japan. It just may be easier to detect planets orbiting other, much more distant stars. This is simply to the fact that it's obvious where to look. You just have to directly look at the star as the planet passes in front of it. In the case of Planet 9, we just don't know where exactly it is located on its potentially 20,000 year long orbit. In recent years, there have been several promising leads in the search for Planet 9. For example, in 2017, a team of astronomers led by Scott Shepard discovered a group of small, distant objects that they believed could be part of Planet 9's orbital swarm. In addition to the Subaru telescope, Shepard's team also used the Magellan telescope, the Discovery Channel telescope, and the Vista telescope to search for additional evidence of Planet 9. Shepard said that his certainty that Planet 9 exists has now risen from about 50% to 60%. Now, he's searching for even smaller objects whose orbits may bear the mark of Planet 9 in the hopes that it might help others figure out where this mysterious planet might be. The invisibility cloak on Planet 9's existence hasn't really stopped astronomers from theorizing about how this planet could have formed. One theory suggests that it could be a former rogue planet that was captured by our solar system at some point in the past. Despite the name, rogue planets are thought to be fairly common and may even be more common than planets that orbit stars. So far, only a few good candidates for rogue planets have been found, but we have found at least two objects that could fit the definition. CFB DSIR 2149-0403 is an object with no more than 13 Jupiter masses, which makes it a pretty good candidate for a Jupiter-sized planet or a lower-end dwarf and another one called PSO J31 8.5-22 has cloud temperatures that are estimated to be above 800 degrees Celsius despite really not having a host star. I mentioned these two possibilities because the information we have about them points to two very different planets. This shows that whatever planet I might be, it's gonna be pretty strange and interesting. Scientists have looked into how a rogue planet can stay hot even without a star, but not show up on infrared. Well, if the conditions are just right, a planet that forms with a thick enough atmosphere could keep its heat even if it doesn't get any sunlight. After all, the Earth is still geothermally active even though no heat from the sun hitting the surface of the planet gets transferred to the core. If a rogue planet had a geodynamo and a magnetosphere, it would help keep the upper atmosphere from being stripped away as the planet left its original solar system or slowly worn away over hundreds of millions of years. The same things that could trap heat on the surface of these worlds would also make it very unlikely that infrared searches would find them. Most of the time, a planet that didn't really belong in our solar system would just spin out again, possibly pulling one of our own planets with it. About 40% of the time though, the rogue planet would be caught, either without affecting the orbits of planets closer to us or by kicking out one of our own. 
which of these is most likely depends on how the experiment is set up. It's also possible that Planet 9 either doesn't exist or it does, but form in the orbit of our sun like the other known planets. Since any wandering planet bigger than Neptune would have probably messed with the orbits of the inner planets, a lot of simulations suggest an upper limit for a Planet 9's size that is in line with other predictions. Planet 9's proposed orbit fits perfectly with the idea of a captured rogue planet, but the most likely orbits don't require a rogue, they just leave room for one. Another really interesting idea is that Planet 9 might not even be a planet at all, but rather a primordial black hole beyond the orbit of Neptune. In fact, this might explain why there are strange gravitational effects in the outer solar system. Unlike black holes that emerge from the remains of collapsed stars, primordial black holes are tiny, between the size of a baseball and a bowling ball. Primordial black holes have never been observed directly, but they are thought to have formed soon after the Big Bang, when changes in the density of matter in the early universe created small, super-dense pockets of matter. This could explain the strange orbits of these TNOs, or trans-Neptunian objects, which are again groups of asteroids and comets that are part of the solar system beyond Neptune and the Kuiper Belt. Scientists thought that these objects circled the sun on a path so elliptical that it could only be really caused by the gravity of a planet in the outer solar system that is anywhere up to 15 times heavier than Earth. But the search of Planet 9 hasn't turned up anything yet. The new primordial black hole theory could lead to new ways to look for the mysterious object that lurks in the outermost fringes of our solar system. Researchers think that the primordial black hole got caught in the sun's gravitational field and was pulled into our solar system. If the black hole does exist beyond Neptune, it is probably surrounded by a dense halo of dark matter, an invisible type of matter that is thought to make up 27% of the universe. At some point in the future, we might be able to see a primordial black hole by detecting the radiation given off when these dark matter particles interact with other particles in the region. And just maybe, we'll finally know what Planet 9 is. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed it, and hit the notification bell icon if you want to watch more content. Stay tuned for more content, and I'll see you guys next week.